The second New Testament reading for this Christmas Eve comes again from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 through 20, the shepherds and the angels. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. Thus ends the reading of the New Testament scripture. May our lives be blessed from the wisdom thereof. You will find in our first scripture... This evening, in the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke, these words in its seventh verse. And laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. For 4,000 years, the world had been looking for Christ. Prophets had been prophesying about the coming Messiah. And Jewish mothers had been praying and hoping that they might be the mother of the king to come. And now that he has arrived, we find that he is laid in a borrowed cradle. There was no room for them in the inn. Why? Why was there no room for them in the inn? Well, for one thing, in order to comply with the census requirements which we heard in the scripture, large numbers of people were on the move, including relatives of Joseph. In those days, they didn't come to you. You had to go to them. No one had any room that year because Caesar Augustus, the first Roman emperor, called for a census after ushering in a period of peace following many, many civil wars. He decreed this census for military and taxation purposes, and even though the Jews were exempt from Roman military service, they were to travel to their hometowns in order to be present for the census taking. Those under Roman rule viewed the census as yet another means of governmental oppression by this foreign power. Because the town was filled with natives, people who'd come from far and wide, even if there were commercial lodging available in Bethlehem, Mary and Joseph would not have done what most people in those days did. They would have stayed with friends or relatives. Whosoever property that they ended up at, the only room available wasn't a room at all. It was likely a cave, anthropologists tell us. A cave, a stall where animals are kept at night by their owners to keep them warm and to keep them from being stolen. Such caves were common places in that region and in those days, and people made use of them. So Christ's humility came right from the start. Given he was the Son of God, he might have come to earth with all the grandeur and glory of the upper world. He might have been ushered in by 10,000 angels. Legions upon legions of trumpets might have heralded his advent. He might have been born in a palace or a castle or upon a throne if he had chosen to. But he just became poor, 
for your sake and mine. For if he had not, he could not have told the people to humble themselves. His scathing remunerations later to the money changers at the temple would have fallen on deaf ears. They might have laughed him out of the temple if he were rich and casting stones at people just like him. No, Jesus passed by the mansions, the thrones, and the dominions and came to us from a manger more than two millennia ago. His cradle was not only borrowed, but almost everything he owned was borrowed. He didn't own it at all. He had, he, it was a borrowed beast that he rode on as an adult into Jerusalem. And it was a borrowed grave they laid him in at the end. When dignitaries and kings come to visit us in this country, what a welcome they receive. There are bands and speeches and receptions and sometimes even balls. When the Prince of Heaven came down, what kind of reception did he meet with? There were no hallelujahs from the people. When the wise men told Herod, he is king of the Jews, for we have seen his star in the east. Not only was Herod worried, all Jerusalem, every man that had been looking for the Messiah seemed to be troubled, and the whole city was excited. But today, today is this man's birthday. What of us? Are we excited? Those of us who are senior citizens perhaps groan sometimes at the advent of our commercially oriented Christmas. While we're here, maybe our minds are somewhere else. For in our celebrations, there are still presents probably to buy, particularly if you guy and you wait till the last minute, gifts to wrap and send to loved ones who are distant. There is food to prepare for guests who may come by. And there are regular schedules to juggle because we're busy. We're busy. There's almost no time for Christmas at Christmas time. Time. Time goes on. It ticks by. And every day we think to ourselves, I'll pray tomorrow. I'll read my Bible tomorrow. I'll get to it. We put an extra chair up to the dinner table when an unexpected guest arrives without even thinking twice about it. Is Jesus just a guest in our house? Just an annual visitor who swings by? If so, that is where we fall short. Let's make some room for Jesus like he lives with us. Not, a, not place him on the back burner of our days, but front and center. Let us be sure that he has a place in our lives, our homes, and our hearts. Because Jesus isn't just a thing. He's not a picture on the wall. He isn't just an invention, a quick lunch, or a moment of gift opening to be penciled onto our tablet's calendar on December 25th. He was a real human being, and he was sent to a deeply troubled world, one that had been bickering and fighting and shedding blood for centuries to show us the way, to show us God's plan, his way, and to absolve us of our sins and set us on the right path. His parents may have been forced to provide humble beginnings for the king of the Jews, a manger of straw, a borrowed cloth for a blanket, but to him, that wouldn't matter. Humble could have been his middle name, but the humility and poverty Christ lived was merely in this world. His soul was rich with the wisdom of the ages. We need only look to his beatitudes to confirm what was in our Lord's heart. Blessings to those who mourn. Blessings to those who are persecuted. Those who are poor in spirit. Those who are peacemakers. Jesus' life is rich rich with pain and love. His message is deep with direction on how to live, how to please God, how to create peace in a world full of discord, how to make room in our lives for those moments and people that matter the most. 
not the least of whom are the downtrodden among us. When has not one of us failed to drop to our knees in supplication to God when our lives turn upside down? Oh God, we pray, help us. And when we have not raised our eyes and hands to the sky and thanks to the one, when something wonderful happens, we feel so blessed. We need him. We know we need him. And we acknowledge him, even if only subtly at times and even if only on his birthday. But aren't we always asking him to stop what he's doing and listen to us, hear us, and oh yes, answer us, answer those prayers, God? Well, he does hear us. He does listen to us. He will answer us. The question should really be not, God, can you hear me? Or Jesus, why haven't you helped me? The question should really be, what have we done for God today? Have we created peace anywhere? Have we made room in our hearts? Have we invited him in, really in, like having a room in an inn? Have we given him that kind of private space in our soul? For only he, if he exists in our hearts, only if he exists in our hearts because we let him in, can we hear his messages of love and peace. Only if we let him in, if we make room for him, can we be at peace with ourselves, our loved ones, and this ragged and bone-tired world around us. Sometimes we wonder if he hears us. But the answer could be this. We're unsure because he's not yet fully in our hearts. We only hope he is. For those of us with him in our hearts and souls, Christmas, his birth, is true joy. He has come bringing message upon message upon message to all of us. It's all in the good book. Can we be still long enough to hear those words? Will we listen when he's whispering in our ear? The thing is, your faith brings light to your life and your loved ones, whether you're aware of it or not. You all have the power as his disciples on earth to light up the world with grace, with kindness, with brotherly love. But only if you truly let him in. Finally, I will leave you with this thought. We must also remember, this is important, we may be the only Bible, if you will, that non-Christians may ever see. Our lifestyle, what we say, what we do, and who we really are inside influences the lives of so many others, everyone we come in contact with. What kind of influence must we be for others? It is God's covenant that we carry on his work in Jesus' name. If we want to show joy, love, trust, and honor, then we all know what we must do. We must make an inn in our hearts for the king. On this, his 2000th, 2000th, 21st birthday, say that fast five times, let us ask ourselves if we have prepared a room in the inn of our heart for the one who was born today so many years ago. Let also remember the most important gift we can give us is our heart to him. The most important gift we can give is our heart to him. And fortunately, that's one gift that's never out of stock. In his name we pray. Amen. And all the people said, Amen. All right. Let's light some candles here. First, the Christ candle, which is the center candle, candle on the altar. The Christ candle represents the light the Son brought into the world when he was born a little baby, God in the flesh. Rejoice. 
We light this fifth candle today called the Christ candle as a testament to our devotion to Christ and our commitment to leading the life he asked of us. Today's candle symbolizes the great joy we feel at the birthday of the great I Am, the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus, our beloved teacher. May the lighting of this candle be a sign to the Trinity of this church's fealty for the virtues of his teaching. Let us pray. Lord, we pray you recognize our fruitful servants at Franklin Grove Church of the Brethren. We seek your guidance and your love and mercy every day. Thank you for giving us your son to save us from our sins today and forever. We love you, Lord. Happy birthday. Please come again. This world needs you now more than ever. Amen. So this is the fun part for all of you. Because it's COVID, I ask that you, if there's a stranger nearby, try to keep six feet. But let's make a circle around the church. Take your candles and we're going to light them. And then we're going to sing Silent Night, after which I'll deliver a short benediction and then we'll be done for tonight. Christ the Savior
Savior is born. First verse again. Son. 